Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Welcome to day number two of our Xanathar's Guide to Everything week. Uh, in the last video, the first video, we looked at uh, druids, barbarians, and rangers, our primal inspired characters. Today we're going to be getting a little bit of divine inspiration. We're going to be taking a look at the classes that usually rely on some sort of patron or higher power for their abilities. Today we're going to be looking at the cleric, uh, the Paladin, and the Warlock. So without further ado, we're going to get right to it, and we're going to start off by having a look at the Clerics. Alright, so here we have the Cleric. Um, so the Cleric in Xanathar's Guide to Everything has two brand new domains that have been introduced, but before we get to those, I just want to touch a little bit on the sort of the background information that the cleric class presents uh, in this book. Uh, so like all the other classes that I've talked about so far, there's a little, some charts and stuff that you can use to kind of flesh out your backstory, background, and uh, some interesting ways that you can kind of make your character feel a little bit more realistic or help, help them sort of come to life. And uh, with the options that they give here involve the type of temple that uh, perhaps you were a part of, and uh, the thing that I like the most uh, on this chart, and I'm not going to read every single option here, but if you want, you can pause it and look through. Uh, I typically make dwarf clerics uh, as NPCs uh, for games that I run, and I love the idea of number three, uh, saying you come from a temple uh, famed for the brewery it operates. Some say you smell like one of its ales. So I think that's just really cool. They also have some keepsakes. Uh, so these are items that just symbolize their faith. Could be like the finger bone of a saint. Uh, for like fiend hunters and things like that, there could be a metal bound book uh, that tells you how to hunt and destroy infernal creatures. And just, you know, things again that you can use as uh, just representations of your faith beyond just the holy symbol. So this is sort of more of a personalized item. Uh, but the thing that I like the most are the secrets. So the secrets are things that are almost like flaws uh, for your cleric. So in addition to your personality tray flaw, uh, there could be some interesting secrets that you could use as part of just being a cleric. For example, uh, you know, an imp that offers you counsel. Uh, you try to ignore the creature, but sometimes its advice is helpful. Uh, to me, this is a really cool idea, and I would love the opportunity to sort of role play something like this out. Um, you know, another one s says that, you know, you believe that in final analysis the gods are nothing more than ultra-powerful mortal creatures, which in the Forgotten Realms there's a lot of reason to believe that. Um, you know, going back to the time of Troubles and uh, a fact, the fact that a lot of gods were ascended mortals. So, just some really cool ideas um, that can, again, just make your character feel a little bit more dynamic and interesting. But what we're really here for right now is to go over the new domains that have been introduced uh, for this book. So we've got, the first one we've got is the Forge Domain, and here's an example here, and it's the perfect um, domain for Dwarven Clerics, which again is something that I make a lot of. So I'm actually really interested to see, you know, to, to make something along these lines. Uh, the idea of the Forge Domain is that it's built around the idea of creating things, um, or enchanting things. So. Um, let's just look at some of its abilities here. Uh, we'll start with our domain spells. So these are spells that you get to add to the cleric spell list that aren't normally part of that list. So at first level they get uh, Identify and Searing Smite. At third level they get Heat Metal and Magic Weapon. At fifth level uh, Elemental Weapon or protect or, and Protection from Energy. At seventh level uh, Fabricate Wall of Fire. And at ninth level they get Animate Objects and Creation. Uh, for proficiencies, they get a bonus proficiency at first level, giving them proficiency with heavy armor, uh, which again really works well for Dwarven Clerics. And they also become proficient automatically in Smith's tools if they don't already have that proficiency from their background or class. Uh, they also get Blessing of the Forge at first level. Uh, so at the end of a long rest, you can imbue magic into a weapon or armor. Um, so you complete the long rest and you touch one non-magical object that is a suit of armor or a simple or martial weapon until the end of your next long rest or until you die, uh, hopefully the long rest though, uh, the object becomes a magic item granting a plus one bonus to AC of its armor or plus one to attack and damage if it's a weapon. Uh, once you use this feature you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. So it's a way of just being able to, um, you know, if one of the characters is getting hit a lot, you can use it to 
uh, buff their armor up a little bit, or if you're going up against things like uh, some of the undead that you may face at early levels, have uh, resistance to uh, bludgeoning, bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage from non-magic weapons. So if you think you might be going up against undead like that, then the plus one weapon you know, can certainly make up for that. So it's a pretty versatile ability, and it's a, it's a great ability at first level. Uh, to be able to have and now it's not technically an actual magic item so you know if you're running adventures league it wouldn't count uh, towards the number of items that you have or anything like that but it is a really cool ability and I like it quite a bit all right uh, the next feature is their channel divinity which they get at second level uh, so they get artisan's blessing now there's a lot of text here and I'm gonna make it uh, just break it down and make it a lot simpler uh, so what you, this is is it's an hour-long ritual and at the end of the ritual, you create a mundane, non-magical item that has to be uh, partially made up of metals. And it's something, so it can be like a suit of armor, it can be weapons, uh, it can be a tool set, um, or any, even any item from like the equipment list that is primarily metal, are things that you can make using this ritual. Now there is a limit of 100 gold pieces. So there's a maximum amount uh, of worth that you can make something you know, using this ability. So, for example, you're not going to have a second level character uh, just magically making uh, a suit of full plate armor appear. Uh, also, as part of the ritual, you have to lay out metal, which can include coins with a value equal to the creation. So if you're creating an item that costs 100 gold uh, as part of the normal equipment list, then you would have to lay out 100 gold pieces worth of metal. Now that can be a hundred gold coins, you know, for example. Um, <clears throat> so it's a really cool ability and again it's it's a non-magical item but it's still something that you can just create, you know, like ammunition, weapons, uh, some of the lighter suits of metal armor. Uh, you can also use it to create a duplicate of a non-magical item uh, that contains metal, such as a key. So if you end up stealing a key off of somebody um, but you know you have to give it back to them, or else it you know, rouses suspicion, then having this ability, you can actually create a copy of it, which is pretty cool. And then uh, at 6th level, they get Soul of the Forge. Um, so uh, your mastery of, of the Forge grants you, the special, or grants you these special abilities. You get resistance to fire damage, meaning that you take half damage from any fire-based attacks that you would uh, be hit by. And while wearing heavy armor, you gain a plus one bonus to AC. So this domain is pretty much all about wanting to wear uh, heavy armor. Uh, at 8th level, they get Divine Strike. So uh, once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can use the attack, uh, you can cause the attack, sorry, to deal an extra 1d8 fire damage to the target. When, when you reach 14th level, it becomes 2d8. So it's only on the first hit per turn. Uh, so it's not something you're going to be able to do if you like if you have multiple attacks each time, but for the first attack that you hit with each round, uh, which can include an opportunity attack, um, you can deal uh, an extra 1d8 fire damage, which is pretty cool. And then at 17th level, they gain <coughs> the Saint of Forge and Fire. So at 17th level, your blessed affinity with fire and metal becomes even more powerful. So instead of having resistance to fire damage, you now gain full-out immunity to fire damage. And while you're wearing heavy armor, in addition to the plus one bonus that you got before, uh, you also get resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage from non-magical attacks. So meaning that um, any normal weapon attack that hits, or even like natural weapons like claws or bites or slams, things like that, if, if they're not magically enchanted, then you're only taking half damage, which is pretty good. All right, uh, the next domain <coughs> that we're going to look at here is the Grave Domain. So this is a domain that is um, provided by the gods of death, uh, such as uh, Kelimvor in the Forgotten Realms, uh, Weejoss in Greyhawk, um, as well as a few other, like the Undying Court, which I believe is the... Uh, thing in Eberron that I was talking about when I was looking at the ancestral uh, guardians for the barbarian ability. Um, the Undying Court, I think, were the ones that sort of venerate their, their ancestors. Uh, the basic idea behind it is it's all about destroying undead, which is something that they consider to be um, something that's a, a basically a sin against nature. Um, so they oppose the cheating of death 
but they're not opposed to prolonging or uh, preventing death uh, from occurring at certain points. So, for example, they're not against the idea of you know raising heroes or things like that. Uh, but a hero that wants to uh, prevent death by becoming like you know a, a wizard turning into a lich, for example, is something that they certainly just do not like. Uh, looking at their abilities. At first level, so their domain spells that they gain. At first level is Bane, False Life. Third level, Gentle Repose, Rave Enfeeblement. At fifth level, Revivify and Vampiric Touch. At seventh level, uh, Blight and Death Ward. And at ninth level, Anti Life Shell and Raise Dead. Uh, the first level ability that they get is called Circle of Mortality. And uh, you gain the ability to manipulate the line between life and death. So when you would normally roll one or more dice to restore hit points, with a spell to a creature at zero hit points, so for example, if you're going to cast Cure Wounds on somebody who's uh, unconscious and bleeding out, um, instead of rolling the dice, you use the highest possible. So let's just say you used a first level Cure Light Wounds against an unconscious uh, player character, or individual. Uh, instead of rolling the dice, you just basically give them 8 plus your Wisdom modifier back in hit points. Uh, in addition, you learn the Spare the Dying Cantrip, uh, which doesn't count against the number of clear cantrips you know. So you get that one for free and you can still choose your others um, based off the chart. And for you, uh, the Spare the Dying Cantrip actually has a range of 30 feet and you can cast it as a bonus action, which I think before normally it was a range of touch. And um, it, or it was touch or like within 5 feet or something, uh, but it was very close and it was a normal action. So in this case, it's actually a bonus action. Uh, at first level, you also get Eyes of the Grave. So you gain the ability to occasionally sense the presence of the undead, uh, whose existence is an insult to the natural cycle of life. Uh, as an action, you can open your awareness to magically detect undead. Until the end of your next turn, you know the location of any undead within 60 feet of you that isn't behind total cover and that isn't protected from divination magic. Uh, this sense doesn't tell you the, anything about the creature's capabilities or identity. So if there was like skeletons, zombies, and like a lich, for example, you wouldn't know uh, what they're actually made up of. You just know that there's undead in there. So, you know, you could be surprised by the fact that there's a powerful undead with some lesser ones, for example. Um, and you can use this feature a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier with a minimum of once, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Uh, at second level, you get Channel Divinity Path to the Grave. So you can use your Channel Divinity to mark another creature's life force for termination, which sounds really terrifying. Uh, as an action, you choose one creature you can see within 30 feet of you, cursing it until the end of your next turn. Uh, so this does take an action, meaning that you wouldn't be able to take do like a normal attack afterwards. You'd be limited to bonus actions and a reaction. Um, the next time you or an ally of yours hits the cursed creature with an attack, the creature has vulnerability to all damage dealt this way, uh, or dealt with the attack. Uh, so, uh, and then the curse ends. So it's it's a one hit thing, but that one hit deals double damage. So you'd roll the dice, add your modifier, and then multiply the result by two, and that's for anything. So, for example, a rogue sneak attack. Um, all that damage would be doubled. Um, so it's it's actually really nasty. And it just says with an attack, so it doesn't even specify necessarily that it has to be a weapon attack, just any sort of attack roll. So that is a pretty, pretty mean ability. Uh, luckily it's only for one hit though, otherwise it'd be pretty broken. Uh, the next ability that they get is at 6th level, uh, Sentinel at Death's Door. So, you gain the ability to impede death's progress. As a reaction, when you or a creature you can see within 30 feet of you suffers a critical hit, uh, you can turn that hit into a normal hit. Any effects triggered by a critical hit are cancelled. And then you can use this feature a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier with a minimum of once, and you have to get a long rest in before you get them back. So, what this means is if a raging half-orc barbarian hits you uh, with a great axe and rolls a natural 20, 
uh, that could potentially be rolling up to 3d12 plus their strength. Uh, using this ability, you can cancel that out and just make it a normal hit, meaning it's just the 1d12. And if they had any other things like an enchanted weapon or anything else that deals extra damage on a critical, or triggers some sort of effect on a critical, like it slows them or weakens them or anything along those lines, all that is negated and doesn't happen. Uh, at 8th level, they get Potent Spellcasting, which allows them to add their Wisdom modifier to the damage that they roll for any cleric cantrip. And at 17th level, they get Keeper of Souls. Uh, so you can seize a trace of vitality from a parting soul and use it to heal the living. When an enemy you see dies within 60 feet of you, you or one creature of your choice that is also within 60 feet of you uh, regains hit points equal to the enemy's number of hit dice. Uh, you can use this feature only if you aren't incapacitated, and once you use it, you can't do so again until the start of your next turn. So, just to sort of break that down, um, if you were facing an enemy that had, let's just say, uh, 10 hit dice, and you uh, they die within 60 feet of you, one of your allies is, is wounded, or even potentially unconscious, you could then uh, have them heal 10 hit points, yourself or somebody else. Um, so that's actually pretty good. Now, if something with more hit dice gets killed, you know, shortly thereafter, unfortunately that's it. Like, you can't use that a second time until you get the next round in. So if it's during the same combat round, then you can't really do anything about that. But it is still a pretty decent ability. The one thing about, about this is I don't normally, um, so when I'm running games, I typically just have, uh, like, the stats of the monsters, I'll type them out on like a word document and uh, I do that for a few different reasons number one I don't take like laptops or you know uh, mobile devices with me I don't really like those too much to be honest when it comes to running D&D games uh, two um, I love writing out the their stats and abilities and special attacks and all that because it helps me learn them as I do it and it also prevents me from having to open up the monster manual so I try to when I'm running uh, sessions I try to open up the books as little as possible uh, so the one thing that I don't do, however, is record their number of hit dice. I just t typically note how many hit points they have, and that's that's a different thing altogether. So uh, if I had somebody in my group that was going to be using that domain once they got to that level, uh, if I continued to type out the stats myself, I would have to start making notes of the number of hit dice so that they could get that uh, the use out of those abilities. So those were the clerics, and I actually like both of those quite a bit. Um, you know, when it came to the last video, I wasn't really too keen on many of the options that were in there. Um, now they're not, it's based more or less on the fact that I don't typically play or make things like barbarians, druids. Uh, I do like to make them play rangers, but that very rarely ever, ever happens. Uh, so I was really happy to find that I liked both of these domains quite a bit. So that was the cleric, and you know, let me know what you guys think about the domains, if you like these compared to the ones that are in the Player's Handbook or Sword Coast Adventures Guide. Uh, I like these ones quite a bit, and I can't wait to make an NPC dwarf cleric with the Forge domain. So that was the clerics, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to move on to the paladins. Alright, so it's time to look at the Paladin now. Uh, so, again, like all the other classes, there are some charts here for the, uh, the character's background, personality stuff that you may want to consider uh, above and beyond what you normally get for your like background and stuff like that. Uh, so there's personal goals, which, again, I'm not going to really read off. Um, these are alright. Uh, I like things like, um, you know, if you're playing a... Uh, you know, Paladin, you may have faith, so you know your path is righteous, or else the gods would not have set you upon it. So there's some interesting things like that. So again, if you want to read each of those, uh, then by all means. Uh, so they also have uh, symbols. Uh, so Paladins are mindful of the influence of symbols, and many of them adopt a design uh, or design an artistic device that bears a distinctive image. Uh, your symbol exemplifies the oath you have taken and com communicates that message to those around you. Uh, friend and foe alike. Your symbol might be displayed on a banner, a flag, or your clothing for all to see. Or it could be less obvious, such as a trinket or token you conceal carried on your person. So there are just things like, you know, a dragon, which is emblematic of your nobility in peace and your ferocity in combat, a clenched fist, 
Uh, so again, these are kind of some interesting things as well. Uh, one of the, the two things that I actually like a lot with this one are the, the Nemesis feature. So, for example, these, this is somebody that, you know, you may have, um, you know, made an enemy of in the past, uh, before you began your adventuring career, or even something that, you know, may become a nemesis down the road type of thing as you're adventuring. But there's things like a mighty orc warchief, uh, who threatens to overrun and destroy everything that you hold sacred, a uh, fiend or celestial, the agent of a power of the outer planes, who has been charged with corrupting or redeeming you as appropriate, uh, a dragon who whose servants dog your steps. So these are some great, uh, again, options for dungeon masters in particular to be wary of, to keep in mind, uh, when creating some story elements and scenarios for the players to go through. There's also the temptations. And again, I like these quite a bit. So they're similar to character flaws, um, like what they had with the, uh, with the clerics and what you have with each of the backgrounds. And just something, again, that can make for some really interesting opportunity for role-playing. Uh, I'm not going to read them all again, but if you want to uh, read them all, then certainly pause the video. Uh, I like the ones like Fury, so when your anger is roused, you have trouble thinking straight, and you fear you might do something you'll regret, or, you know, lust, you can't resist an attractive face or a pleasant smile. Um, I know a player who would probably choose that if they were making a paladin. Uh, so these, again, are just really cool. Uh, but what we're here for are the Sacred Oaths. So this book presents two new Sacred Oaths. Um, the first one we're going to look at is the Oath of Conquest. And the Oath of Conquest, uh, I'm just going to read the first little bit here. So, calls the paladins who seek glory in battle and the subjugation of their enemies. It isn't enough for these paladins to establish order. They must crush the forces of chaos, sometimes called night tyrants or ironmongers. Those who uh, swear this oath gather into grim orders that serve gods or philosophies of war and well-ordered might. So, uh, if you're running Forgotten Realms, uh, the god Bane, uh, this would be a perfect paladin for Bane. Now, overall, this feels more or less like uh, something you would have for evil characters. I don't know how much I'd really want my players to use this in a campaign. It feels like a great thing for an NPC villain, for example. Um, so, they've got their tenets of conquest, so to douse the flame of hope, it is not enough to merely defeat an enemy in battle. Your victory must be so overwhelming that your enemy's will, fight, or will to fight is shattered forever. A blade can end a life. Fear can end an empire. And then there are um, rule with an iron fist. So once you have conquered, you t or once you have conquered, tolerates no dissent. Your word is law, and those who obey it uh, shall be favored. Those who defy it shall be punished. Uh, as an example to all who might follow. Whoops. And then we have strength above all. You shall rule until a stronger one arises, then you must grow mightier and meet the challenge, or fall to your own ruin. So again, not the greatest, not the greatest um, thing for heroic characters or her a heroic campaign, but I'm sure there's probably a way that you could make this work. Uh, we start off here uh, with the oath features, so they get oath spells. Um, so you skip these ones as well, I believe in addition. So at third level, uh, armor of Agathus and command at fifth level hold person spiritual weapon at ninth level bestow curse or fear uh, 13th level dominate beast and stone skin and at 17th level cloud kill and dominate person uh, when you choose this ability at third level with the channel divinity um, you can use it for conquering presence uh, so you use this cha uh, channel divinity to exude a terrifying presence uh, as an action, you force each creature of your choice that you can see within 30 feet of you to make a wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, a creature becomes frightened of you for one minute. Uh, the frightened creature can repeat this saving throw at the end of each of its turn, uh, each of its turns, ending the effect on itself uh, on a success. So, yeah, you basically make them uh, frightened uh, as per the condition which I think they get uh, disadvantage on any like attack rolls and checks and stuff like that made while the source of their fear is within line of sight and that they can't uh, of their own free will move closer to the source of their fear. Uh, you can also use guided strike so use your channel divinity to strike with supernatural accuracy. Uh, when you make an attack roll you can use the channel divinity to gain a plus 10 bonus to the roll. Uh, make this choice after you see the roll but before the DM says whether it hits or misses. Uh, that's a pretty standard one that other um, like clerics uh, have had for their domain abilities, so it's along those same lines. Uh, they also get Aura of Conquest. 
So at 7th level, you constantly emanate a menacing aura while you're not incapacitated. The aura extends 10 feet from you in every direction, but not through total cover, so like not through solid walls, for example. Uh, if a creature is frightened of you, its speed is reduced to zero while in the aura, and that creature takes psychic damage equal to half your paladin level if it starts its turn there. Uh, so you'd round, you'd round that down. So at 7th level, if somebody's frightened of you, uh, their speed is reduced to zero, and if they start their turn in your aura, then uh, they're taking three points of damage, and then that increases every time you level as well. Uh, so at 8th level, it'd be f uh, four points of damage, and so on. Uh, if we see here, at 18th level, the range of the aura increases to 30 feet. Uh, they also gain Scornful Rebuke. Whoops. So starting at 15th level, those who dare strike you are physically punished for their audacity. Whenever a creature hits you with an attack, that creature takes psychic damage equal to your charisma modifier, uh, minimum of plus one if you're not incapacitated. So if you have a charisma of 16 and somebody hits you in combat, they're going to take three points of damage. Uh, and that's whenever they hit you. So that's pretty, pretty decent. So if they get multiple attacks, they're dealing more damage to themselves. And then the last feature is at 20th level, you become an invincible conqueror. Uh, you gain the ability to harness extraordinary martial prowess. Uh, as an action, you can magically become an avatar of conquest, gaining the following benefits for one minute. So you'd have resistance to all damage, so not just like non-magical or bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing. It's all damage you take half of. Uh, when you take the attack action on your turn, you can make one additional attack as part of that action, uh, which I think would give uh, Paladins three attacks at that point, because they get a second attack, and then I th this would grant them a third. Uh, and your melee weapon scores a critical hit on a roll of 19 or 20 on the d20. Uh, and then once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. And that is the um, that is the Oath of Conquest. So again, I'm not too big on this as far as for player characters, unless I was running like an anti-hero campaign or an evil campaign, which I'm not particularly keen on myself to begin with. Uh, but it, I think, again, this is something that would make for a great uh, villain to have. Or it'd be interesting to have this be something similar to the Oathbreaker Paladin, where you can sort of start off as something else, but slowly uh, kind of change over to this. And I think that'd be an interesting concept to work with as well. Um, but anyway, so that's just kind of how I feel. I think it makes more sense for NPCs uh, than my player characters. I don't necessarily think I'd want my player characters coming to the table uh, with something like this, unless there was a major, major reason for somebody of this nature to be in the party. Uh, the next one I want to look at, however, is the Oath of Redemption. So the basic idea behind this is these paladins believe violence is a last resort for the most part. Uh, their idea is that even some of the most corrupt, uh, corrupted individuals' hearts and souls can potentially be saved. Uh, so they try not to um, not to kill just randomly or because they you know they feel threatened themselves. They try to do what they can uh, to essentially try to, to bring these people back from the brink. Now certain things like you know demons and devils uh, are they know they're inf inherently evil and there's no point in trying to even uh, attempt to redeem them. So uh, fighting like evil outsiders and stuff or undead, they would still go out full force, but against a human or humanoid villain, perhaps, they may be more apt to try to stop them and, you know, incapacitate them and then try to go about saving them. Uh, so, we'll just look at their tenets of the Oath of Redemption. So, the first off is peace. So it says, violence is a weapon of last resort. Diplomacy and understanding are the paths to long-lasting peace. Uh, innocence, all people begin life in an innocent state, and it is their environment or the influence of dark forces that drives them to evil. By setting the proper example and working to heal the wounds of a deeply flawed world, you can set anyone on the righteous path. They also have patience. Uh, so it says, change takes time. Those who have walked the path of the wicked must be given reminders to keep them honest and true. Once you have planted the seed of righteousness in a creature, you must work day after day to allow that seed to survive and flourish. And then lastly, they have wisdom. It says, your heart and mind must stay clear, for eventually you will be forced to admit defeat. 
while every creature can be redeemed, some are so far along the path of evil that you have no choice but to end their lives for the greater good. Any such action must be carefully weighed and the consequences fully understood. But once you have made the decision, follow through with it knowing your path is just. So this almost feels like sort of the stereotypical paladin that I think a lot of people end up wanting to roleplay. Um, you know, being sort of the we can try to save them type of thing. But I, again, I actually like the, the basic idea behind this and I would, I would enjoy playing a paladin of this kind. But let's go through and read their abilities now. So, their Oath Spells. At 3rd level, they gain Sanctuary and Sleep. 5th level, Calm Emotions and Hold Person. Ninth level, Counterspell and Hypnotic Pattern. 13th uh, level, Adi Luke's Resilient Sphere and Stone Skin. And at 17th level, Hold Monster and Wall of Force. So again, they seem uh, sort of defensively oriented uh, around the idea of trying to prevent attacks from taking place. Uh, Channel Divinity, so at 3rd level they gain the following two Channel Divinity options. So there is Emissary of Peace. So you can use your Channel Divinity to augment your presence with Divine Power. As a bonus action, you grant yourself a plus five bonus to Charisma Persuasion checks for the next 10 minutes. Uh, then there's Rebuke the Violent. You can use your Channel Divinity to rebuke those who use violence. Immediately after an attacker within 30 feet of you deals damage with an attack against a creature other than you, you can use your reaction to force the attacker to make a wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, the attacker takes radiant damage equal to the damage it just dealt. On a successful save, it takes half as much. So if they hit somebody and deal um, 10 points of damage, for example, they would take 10 points of radiant damage back on a failed saving throw, or even if they succeed on their wisdom saving throw, they would still take 5 points of damage. Uh, and that... Uh, yeah, it does use your reaction, so that would be something that you can only do once per round. Uh, then there's Aura of the Guardian at 7th level. You can shield others from harm uh, at the cost of your own health. So when a creature within 10 feet of you takes damage, you can use your reaction to magically take that damage instead of that creature taking it. This feature doesn't transfer any other effects that may accompany the damage, and this damage can't be reduced in any way. So if you had, normally if you had some sort of uh, resistance to, to damage, you couldn't use that for this. Uh, at 18th level, the range of this ore increases to 30 feet. So with this, you would take the damage itself, but if there was something that required a saving throw or be immobilized or poisoned or anything along those lines, then that would still take effect on the creature that was originally hit, but you would take the, the points of damage that would come from that. Uh, uh, at, from the physical attack itself. Uh, so at 15th level, they gain Protective Spirit, so, a Holy Presence mends your wounds in battle. You regain hit points equal to 1d6 plus half your Paladin level. Uh, if you end your turn in combat with fewer than half of your hit points remaining, and you aren't incapacitated. So, as long as you're conscious and below half uh, your max hit points, then you would regain 1d6 plus half your Paladin level. So, again, keep in mind that you do round down. So, at 15th level... Uh, half of 15 is 7.5, so you would regain uh, 1d6 plus 7 hit points, which isn't bad. Uh, that's actually a pretty decent ability. And then at 20th level, you get Emissary of Redemption instead of uh, Invincible Conqueror, which the other one had. So at 20th level, you become an Avatar of Peace, which gives the following two benefits. You have resistance to all damage dealt by other creatures. Uh, their attacks, spells, and other effects. Uh, whenever a creature hits you with an attack, it takes radiant damage equal to half the damage you take from the attack. And it says, if you attack a creature, cast a spell, or deal damage to it by any means but this feature, neither benefit works against that creature until you finish a long rest. So if you hit something first, um, you can't uh, gain the benefit of like the resistance if it hits you back, or... Uh, the ability to deal damage back to them. Uh, so those were the Paladins. Uh, again, I liked the Oath of Redemption one quite a bit, and, I, and again, I feel like that's the Paladin that everybody tried to, would, would end up wanting to roleplay anyway. Uh, but I like that uh, Oath quite a bit, actually. It's probably, I would almost say, my favorite of all the Oaths that have been uh, put out for 5th edition officially so far. Uh, when it comes to the Oath of Conquest, I'm not a big fan of that one, like I said before. But I think there are ways that I would use it as a DM and think it would be you know, totally fun to, to play with and actually do something with. But 
Uh, again, I'm not really sure I want my player showing up with that. But anyway, those were the Paladins. Let me know what you guys think of the Paladins in the comment section below. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to move on to the Warlocks. Alright, and finally today we're going to be looking at the Warlock, which may seem like sort of an unusual choice. But again, I wanted to theme the character classes together in a way that makes sense. Try to have three of them in as many videos as I can. And it just sort of makes sense considering the fact that uh, the Warlocks derive their power from a patron as well. Not necessarily a god like clerics or paladins with their divine magic, but it still sort of fits that theme, especially with one of the uh, patrons that we have here that you can actually use. So, But before we get to that, uh, just sort of look over again some of the charts they have. Now, Warlock's the class that I have the least amount of familiarity with. Uh, I've never actually played one myself. Um, so, I, again, I'm, I'm not as comfortable talking about a lot of their stuff or kind of what I think would make for good options for the class or not. But we'll still go through their abilities and see what I think of the ones that are presented here. Uh, one of the first ones that they have here is for the background stuff is just the patron attitudes. Um, so we have things like, you know, the patron, each interaction with your capricious patron is a surprise, whether pleasant or painful. Uh, your patron is a spirit of a long-dead hero who sees your pact as a way for it to continue to influence the world. So just some interesting ideas along those lines. There are also special terms of the pact. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, one, when directed, you must take immediate action against a specific enemy of your patron. Um, or at least once a day, you must inscribe or carve your patron's name or symbol on a wall of a building. So just some, some interesting ideas along those lines that you can do with that. Uh, they also have things like binding marks. Uh, so, uh, for example, once you uh, choose a patron and you're bound to them, you could have something like one of your eyes looks uh, the same as one of your patron's eyes, or each time you wake up, the small blemish uh, on your face appears in a different place, or just sort of things like that that just show that there's something odd going on. Uh, but what I want to talk about here today are the, the otherworldly patrons. Uh, so the, what we have here is the Celestial and the Hexblade. So starting off with the Celestial, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. The Celestial is a a uh, patron from the upper planes, um, like an angel or solar, or just a powerful entity that lives there. And uh, they give, they can create the packs that uh, you get for the Warlock. Uh, to expand the spell list of the Warlock at first level, uh, if you have the Celestial as your patron, you can you get uh, Cure Wounds and Guiding Bolt. Uh, second level, Flaming Sphere and Lesser Restoration. Uh, third level, Daylight and Revivify. Fourth level, Guardian of Faith and Wall of Fire. And at fifth level, uh, flame Strike and Greater Restoration. Uh, also, you get a bonus cantrip, uh, or bonus cantrips. So at first level, you learn the Light and Sacred Flame cantrips. They count as Warlock cantrips for you, but they don't count against the number of cantrips known. So you get these in addition to your normal ones. Uh, you also gain Healing Light, so you gain the ability to channel Celestial Energy to heal wounds. Uh, you have a pool of D6s. Uh, that you spend to fuel this healing. The number of dice of the pool equals one plus your warlock level. So at first level you'd have two of these d6. Uh, as a bonus action, uh, you can heal one creature that you can see within 60 feet of you, uh, spending dice from the pool. Uh, the maximum number of dice you can spend at once equals your charisma modifier. So let's just say you had a, uh, three, uh, a 16 charisma, so you had plus three bonus or plus three modifier, um, and you had four of these D6s to use, you couldn't use any more than three of them at a given time. Um, so when you use the ability, you roll the dice, uh, add them together, and restore a number of that many hit points uh, to the creature. Your pool regains all expended dice when you finish a long rest. Uh, you also get Radiant Soul at sixth level, so your link to the Celestial uh, allows you to serve as a conduit of Radiant Energy. You have resistance to radiant damage, and when you cast a spell that deals radiant or fire damage, you can add your charisma modifier to one uh, radiant or fire damage roll of that spell against one of its targets. So that sounds kind of complicated, but if you had something that uh, allows you to make, um, I think Scorching Ray gives you multiple fire rays um, that you could fire at different targets, so you would only be able to apply it to one of the, like, bolts of from the fire 
uh, Firebolt spell or things along those lines. Um, and let's see here. So when you cast spell um, now, or if it's something like, for example, um, Fireball or something along those lines that hits multiple targets, you also only choose one individual uh, to have that for. All right. Um, up next, we have Celestial Resi uh, Resilience. So starting at 10th level, you gain temporary hit points whenever you finish a short or long rest. Uh, these temporary hit points equal your Warlock level plus your Charisma modifier. Additionally, choose up to five creatures you can see at the end of the rest. Those creatures each gain temporary hit points equal to half your Warlock level plus your Charisma modifier. So at 10th level, if you had that 16 Charisma, you can get 13 um, temporary hit points. And up to five creatures that you see, uh, so other party members, can would gain eight. So five for half your level and three for the Charisma modifier. Again, just as an example. Uh, and then the, at 14th level, there is Searing Vengeance. So at 14th level, the Radiant Energy you channel allows you to resist death. When you have to make a death saving throw at the start of your turn, you can instead spring back to your feet with a burst of Radiant Energy. You regain uh, hit points equal to half your hit point maximum and then stand up if you so choose. Each creature of your choice as within 30 feet of you takes uh, Radiant Damage equal to 2d8 plus your Charisma modifier and is blinded until the end of your current turn. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you complete a long rest. So that is a pretty powerful ability. Um, you can automatically heal back up to half your maximum hit points, and then you can sort of kip up and get up immediately without spending any of your movement, um, and then also deal uh, damage to a bunch of creatures within you know 30 feet of you. So that's it is pretty powerful. The downside is that you can only use it once before you have to complete a long rest to get it back. Um, but overall, I actually like the Celestial Patron quite a bit. Uh, it's one that I'd be interested to try out, and I think it would work great if, if the party was like you know meant to be like strong uh, heroes of like you know pure heroes like clerics and paladins. And if you're trying to theme it around the idea of those type of characters then a Celestial uh, Patron to Warlock would make a pretty good addition to that. Uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the Hexblade. So the Hexblade is a entity from the Shadowfell. Um, essentially uh, becomes your Patron. And um, so it, it derives more or less like Shadow Energy, Shadow Magic, and uh, things along those lines. So. We'll start off with the Hexblade's uh, list of spells that they get, their expanded spell list. So at first level they can add Shield and Wrathful Smite to their list. At second level, Blur and Branding Smite. Third level, Blink and Elemental Weapon. Fourth is Phantasmal Killer and Staggering Smite. And then fifth is Banishing Smite and Cone of Cold. They also get the Hexblade's Curse. So starting at first level, you gain the ability to place a Baleful Curse on someone. So as a bonus action, Choose uh, one creature within 30 feet of you that you can see. Uh, the target is cursed for one minute. The curse ends early if the target dies, you die, or you are incapacitated. Until the curse ends, you gain the following benefits. Now, there's no uh, saving throw allowed. You just simply uh, point at something and they are considered to be cursed. So you gain a bonus damage or bonus to damage rolls against the cursed target uh, equal to your proficiency bonus. Uh, any attack roll you make against a cursed target is a critical hit on a roll of a 19 or 20. Uh, and if the cursed target dies, you regain hit points equal to your Warlock level plus your Charisma modifier for a minimum of 1. Uh, once you are, so you can't use this feature again until you finish a short or long rest. Uh, so not bad, being able to get a little bit of extra damage in there, uh, increase the amount of critical uh, threat range that you deal and uh, to be able to regain hit points if it dies. Uh, it doesn't even say that you have to be the one to kill it, or you have to be within a certain number of feet of it, it's just when the creature dies. Uh, also at first level you get Hex Warrior. So uh, it says you acquire training, uh, the training necessary to effectively arm yourself for battle. You gain proficiency with medium armor, shields, and martial weapons. The influence of your patron also allows you to mystically channel uh, your will through a particular weapon. Whenever you finish a long rest, you can touch one weapon that you're proficient with and that lacks the two-handed property, so uh, can't be used on like great swords, uh, great axes, or things like that. 
uh, when you attack with that weapon, you can use your Charisma modifier instead of Strength or Dexterity for the attack and damage rolls, and this benefit lasts until you finish a long rest. Uh, if you later uh, gain the Pla Pact of the Blade feature, this benefit extends to every packed weapon you conjure uh, with that feature, no matter the weapon's type. Uh, so it's kind of cool about this now. It can't have the two-handed property, but it can have the versatile property since that is something altogether different. So you could have a longsword, for example, uh, that you cast there that you use this on, and even if you use it two-handed to roll the d10, you can still get your charisma modifier instead of strength. So, you know, if you have a low strength score, but a decent charisma, then that could be a really cool thing to use. So just keep that in mind, that two-handed is not the same as versatile, which allows you to wield a weapon with two hands. All right, up next, we have the Accursed Spectre. So starting at 6th level, you can curse the soul of a person you slay, temporarily binding it to your service. But when you slay a humanoid, you can cause its spirit to rise from its corpse as a spectre. The statistics for which are in the Monster Manual. When the spectre appears, it gains temporary hit points equal to half your warlock level, so a minimum of 3 since you get it at 6th level. You roll initiative for the spectre, which has its own turns, it obeys your verbal commands, and it gains a special bonus to attack rolls equal to your charisma modifier. So minimum of plus zero. So if you had a bad charisma and had a penalty to your charisma, it would still not be penalized. It would, it would just do its normal uh, attack rolls. The Spectre remains in your service until the end of your next long rest, at which point it vanishes to the afterlife. Once you bind a Spectre with this feature, you can't use this feature again until you finish a long rest. Uh, so this is actually, I consider this to be sort of a powerful ability uh, to be able to get a Spectre uh, more or less for free using not only the Spectre stats, but having it have extra hit points and possibly a higher attack bonus. Um, so that's, that's to me, I consider that to be really powerful, especially at 6th level. It almost seems like 6th level is kind of a low level to get that ability on. But anyway... There you go. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing, but it, it definitely feels like a powerful ability. And then at 10th level you get Armor of Hexes. So your hex grows more powerful. If the target cursed by your Hexblade's curse hits you with an attack roll, you can use your reaction to roll a d6. On a 4 or higher, the attack miss instead misses you regardless of its roll. So even a natural 20 could be rendered a miss if you use this ability and get 4 or 5 or 6 on the, on the 6 sided die. At uh, 14th level you get Master of Hexes so you can spend your hex or you can spread your Hexblade's curse from a slain creature to another creature. Uh, when the creature cursed by your Hexblade's curse dies you can apply the curse to a different creature you can see within 30 feet of you provided you aren't incapacitated. Uh, the downside is that when you do this, you don't regain hit points from the death of the previously cursed creature. So if you decide to move it to a different uh, enemy, then you don't gain the hit points back, but you still get the ability to gain the hit points from the thing that you move the curse onto. And that is the class, um, the patrons, uh, otherworldly patrons for uh, the Warlock class. Now there are the invocations as well. Uh, I'm not really going to go into those uh, specifically in this video. If you want me to discuss uh, the invocations, let me know in the comments below and I'll be more than happy to look into doing that. But at this point, I really don't feel the need to kind of discuss these. I just wanted to go over the actual uh, new uh, class features for like the patrons that you can possibly get. Uh, so that is the Hexblade, that was the Paladin, and that was the Cleric for Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Uh, overall, um, the Cleric is probably the one that I liked the most. Both of the domains were ones that I would actually see myself wanting to use, uh, either for NPCs or even if I was to play a Cleric, I could see myself wanting to use either one of those domains. Uh, as far as the Paladin goes, uh, again, I wasn't too keen on the uh, Oath of Conquest, but I did like the Oath of Redemption. And for the Warlock, uh, I think both of those were pretty solid. Uh, I don't think you could really go wrong with either. 
Uh, to me, the celestial one fits in if you wanted to theme your campaign around to some, you know, divinely inspired heroes, uh, which I think would make for a really cool story. And the Hexblade is kind of a classic going back to when, like, the Warlock class was sort of first introduced. Um, and, you know, they seem to be pretty decent abilities as well. Again, I think the 6th level one being able to get the Spectre might be a bit powerful. Uh, we'll have to see how it actually plays out. Um, but, again, I think that those are all pretty decent additions. There were none that I was completely um, against, necessarily. Like I said, as much as I didn't like the Oath of Conquest, I would use it as a Dungeon Master, and I would love to use it as a Dungeon Master. Uh, so I liked the options for those three classes overall more than I liked it for the last three that, that I discussed, being the Barbarian, the Druid, uh, and even the Ranger, which is my favorite class, but I wasn't too huge on a lot of the abilities that were introduced there. So those were those classes, so we've got six of the eleven classes down. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this video, hope you found it useful. If you do have any questions about the, the class options presented here in this video, let me know. And again, if you guys are interested in me discussing the different uh, invocations for the Warlock, uh, let me know and I may be able to do that as a separate video sometime down the line. So thank you guys very much for watching, I hope you come back for the next video. So part three, we're going to be looking at uh, martially inspired heroes. We're going to be looking at the, the fighter, uh, the monk, and the rogue. So I uh, hope you come back for that video. Again, thank you guys very much for watching. We'll see you next time.